It's baffled scholars for two millennia. It is a puzzle made of multi-dimensional elements, an enigma with roots that reach back to the dawning of time, perhaps before. Daniel explained part of it. Ezekiel and Isaiah had glimpses into it. John saw it all for the time of the end. That time is now. Join Derek and Sharon Gilbert on a journey that spans the course of history, from Eden to Mount Hermon, from Hermon to Babel, from Babel to Rome, from Rome to the cross, and from there to us. Biblical prophecy is coming true before your eyes, and to understand it, you must discern the times both then and now. It's time to unravel the threads of this all-encompassing prophetic paradox. It's time to unravel Revelation. Welcome to Unraveling Revelation. I'm Derek Gilbert. Joining me again on set this week as we continue a fascinating conversation about where we are prophetically in the world. The author of a number of books, including, uh, boy, you, you, if you haven't read The Rabbi, The Secret Message, and The Identity of Messiah, co-authored with Messianic Rabbi Zev Porat, you really need to get that one. But uh, Carl, your, your books are all Thank wonderful. You. Yeshua Protocol, most recently, Eyes to See. Carl Gallops joining us back in Thank studio. You for Thank you for having me back, Darren. Oh, oh my goodness. Uh, we, we are talking about uh, Israel and, and the restoration of Israel in the land. Yeah, and, it's uh, huge. As you pointed out last week, and, and as our friend Dr. Mike Spaulding recently wrote in a piece for Harbinger's Daily, uh, no, God did not promise there would be a fake Israel right. in the land. So Israel's return in 1948 was an important mile marker on yes. the road towards the end of the age. Yes. Uh, you were talking about Isaiah 49 and the, and the fact that God prophesied that as yes. they returned to the land, they would say the land is too narrow. And we see the calls that have been uh, uh, made for, for decades now for Israel to give up the land that it captured in the Six Day War in 1967, Judea and Samaria, which the world calls the West Bank. It was only recently in looking at a topographical map of Israel that I realized that's the high ground. That's the hill country of Judah and Ephraim, Judah and Israel, that was the focus of Joshua's war of conquest in 1400 BC when he took that land away from the Anakim who were counted as Rephaim only in Gaza and Gath and Ashdod, the Philistine territories. Did some of the Anakim remain? Of course, the Philistine giants, David and his men had to take care of 400 years later. The war of the Rephaim against the Rephaim, the Anakim appears to still be going on because that's the territory, the hill country, that the world wants Israel to return. And if they did that, as our friend Avi Lipkin pointed out, at its narrowest point, that's only nine miles from the western border to the sea. That's indefensible. It is. It is. And Benjamin Netanyahu has said that as well. Back under the administration of, of uh, Obama, uh, he actually said, we need to return to the Six-Day War borders and stuff. And he said that's indefensible. In fact, he said it will be too narrow. That's the exact Hebrew word from Isaiah 49. They will say to me, it will be too narrow. So, yeah, there are so many biblical connections here. And listen, back to Isaiah 49, there is, a, there is a, an amazing hidden gem in the middle of that. Not only where God says, you will say to me, how, how, who brought you back? And I will tell you the Gentiles did. I called the Gentiles. Not only will people say, well, it's too small. Like, that can't be. God says, and in those days you will say it's too small. It, I mean, not only that, but prior... I mean, he, the whole Isaiah 49 said, I'm going to bring them back, going to bring them back, going to bring them from all the place. But then he says, in the day of salvation, I will do this. Now, listen to me, brother. Paul quotes that verse in mm. 2 Corinthians. He quotes that verse. And he is giving it the same biblical inference that I'm going to give it here. Um, a little, little nuance, but it's the same. I'll explain. Brother, you know, and a lot, a lot of your audience will know, and Zev and I write about this in our books all the time, but when we say in Hebrew, Yeshua HaMashiach Adonai, that's Jesus Christ the Lord, or Adonai Nu, our Lord, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Well, what's the word for Jesus? Yeshua. Okay, but Jesus is a, is a 
is an English version from the Greek, which was from uh, then, then translated into Latin, which comes from the Hebrew. The original word for the name Jesus is Yeshua. All right. A lot of Hebrew names have a meaning. Right. The name Yeshua, Gabriel told uh, Mary and Joseph, you will call him Yeshua because he will save his people. Why? Because Yeshua means salvation. Every time you see the word salvation in the Hebrew, it says Yeshua. Mm -hmm. So think of this. When you come to scriptures like in the Psalms, God is my light and he is my Jesus. Mm -hmm. He is my light and my salvation. What does Jesus say? I am the light of the world. Who, well, who is the light and Jesus? God. God is my light and he is my salvation. It says in English. Mm -hmm. What it says in Hebrew, he is my Yeshua. So in Isaiah 49, there's something similar. In the day of salvation, I will this will be accomplished. Interpret that literally. In the day of Jesus. Now, the whole New Testament proclaims, and Paul really proclaims this a lot, but the whole New Testament proclaims that the day of Jesus, that word day, Hebrew, yom, okay? So it can mean one 24-hour day, or it can be like we use the word day. The way we use the word day is exactly the same way the, in the Hebrew language uses it. Well, back in my day, yeah, you or, mean a specific 24-hour yeah, 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 period. Yeah, right. you, you mean a, an epic period of time. Or the day is coming when, well, what day? We're not talking about that. We're talking about an age. Uh, or, or the day of the Lord, the day of this. Okay, so when we speak of the day of salvation, salvation comes ultimately and only through the blood of Jesus Christ. That happened on Calvary's cross, the resurrection. Well, what has happened since then? It wasn't until 1948 when Israel came back. But wait, from the day he rose to the day he comes back, that's called the day of salvation. Because between there and there is the only way now that people can be saved. It, mm -hmm. it, it's always been through the blood. But, but they used to look forward to the coming of the, the blood and the sacrifice. But now we look back on it. It has happened. The day of salvation is from the resurrection till he comes again. So the prophecy in Isaiah 49, and no one could see that until it happened. And then you go back and read it. And that's how God does prophecy. He says, he says, I hide these things so that when they happen, you will see and you will stand in awe. Well, here we are in Isaiah 49. The Gentiles, too small. Uh, the Gentiles brought them back. Okay, I said that. And I said it was too small. And I said that. I said I would bring them from everywhere, even from the Asian nations. And I also said... It won't happen because you remember when this prophecy was given, it was 700 years before Christ. Right. It won't happen until that day of salvation. And right in the middle of it, Israel came back. Jesus died here, crucified here. Paul quotes that verse saying that day is now. That day has happened. Not the return of Israel. He's not really addressing that, but he's quoting from the whole chapter that addresses the return of Israel. So basically what he's saying is, so the return of Israel is going to happen. Maybe not in our lifetime, but it's coming soon because we are now in the day of salvation. Yeah. Interesting. We, we humans have been looking for naturalistic explanations yes. to things happening in the spirit realm yes. for a long time. In the first century, the time of Jesus and the yeah. apostles, they saw Israel under the thumb of the Romans. Yeah. And they just escaped the thumb of the Greeks in the, in the second century BC, first century BC. Um, the Parthians were in there for a little bit as well. They, they were looking for an independent, is, is, they didn't see that in the second century they were going to be scattered to the nations by the Emperor Hadrian, by the Romans. Right. Uh, so they didn't understand what was coming. When that did happen, then you had Christian theologians like Justin Martyr trying to figure out, okay, how can God fulfill his promise to Israel if there is no more, because the Jews are now, they've been, there scared. aren't any Jews in Judea anymore. So we must be, the church must, and that's where this whole I, I, replacement started theology then. started within second century And Constantine, he, was, he kind of egged it on along. Right. He was an anti-Semitic. And there've been other anti-Semitic yes. Semitic yes. Christian theologians yes. throughout history. Martin Luther, sadly, was, was very he was. well known for that. So now here we are in the 21st century, Israel's returned, and now you've got some who want to hang on to that, even though Israel has been returned. It's, it's really ironic that we, so many of us, have been blinded. Yeah. So with Israel returning and fulfilling 50 scriptures, it kind of 
it kind of messes with that whole thing of we've replaced them. It, it, I mean, you know, so they it, there's this constant battle to be right. I, I, you Listen, you and I, I know we've said this together so I can speak for you. I know I can because I've heard you say it and I say it all the time. You and I do not have an egotistical need to be right about everything. Well, I do, but, but that's... Okay, <laughs> well, okay, so you just blew my argument. No, no, well, I've heard I'm, you say I'm that joking, you don't. Of course, You're yeah, joking, yeah. of course. And we don't, we don't. I mean, when we know what we know in, in black and white from the scriptures in context, then we stand on it right. unashamedly. But, but that's not because we have an ego. It's because the Word of God clearly says it. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. I declare, you declare, there's only one way of salvation because it's black and white. Okay, not an egotistical need. So over my many years of ministry at the time we're doing this, I've been in one church preaching for 38 years in one church. So over the years, there's been a few tweaks I've made in my understanding of the word and right, theology. Right. And I've gone to the pulpit and said, I apologize. I used to say this, but I, I understand it much deeper now. Yep. So here's where we're going, because this is what it really says. A lot of things that I brought to the church early on in my ministry came out of my seminary experience. Well, I was in one of the most conservative seminaries on the planet at the time, but since I grew in the Word, I realized even they had some things not contextually accurate. So, in the midst of all of this, we have to make certain that we, we are standing in the Word, we're speaking the truth, we don't have an egotistical need to be right about everything, but I do want to be right as much as possible with the Lord's assistance because we are declaring, thus saith the Lord. Yes, yeah. And that's it. And so, yeah, so it's just time that some of these people that are have been saying these things for decades, it's time that they also humble themselves a little bit. And you and I have had to do this, so I'm not talking down to anybody, but to humble themselves a little bit and put it together contextually. God says, don't you speak when I bring them back? And I know it's smaller than before, and I know I'm using the Gentiles. I get that, but I'm doing it to show the nations. And these are real Hebrew people to one degree or another through DNA, and that's in the NIH website. And this is the real Israel that I prophesied that will drive the nations crazy. And a, and a coalition will form up in Ezekiel 38, led by Persia and whoever Gog and Magog is. Most uh, theologians think it's somehow tied to Russia. Russia is extremely tied to Iran by treaty. Mm -hmm. And so Russia and Iran and China, they all have Asiatic uh, roots and all that from Turkic roots. And I mean, I mean, the Noah's Ark came to rest Mount Ararat in Turkey. Yep. So the whole world, you and I have those roots too, way, way separated, but we do. Mm -hmm. So, so it's just time to take a contextual look at what we now see. Here's Israel returned. There it is. The nations are going crazy. It's strong in the land. It's the number one superpower led by Persia. They're attacking, which means Russia's tied to it. Russia and China are tied together. China and Korea are tor tied together. Turkey is now making nice, nice with Russia and Iran and China. I mean, in one way or the other, they're kind of all forming up. In Turkey, that's Beth Torgama. Tor mm -hmm. Torgama. Right, right. That's in Ezekiel 38 too. So, we just need to understand, and I know this messes with pre-trib, mid-trib, po-trib, and I'm not going to get into that, but you got all these isms and schisms. Well, it can't be that because, because it doesn't fit our scheme, and it, doesn't, it can't be that because it's too small, and it can't be that because of the Gentiles, and it can't, it can't, it can't. And I'm just back here going, uh, the Bible says something differently about all of that. Yeah. I'm going to stick to what the contextual Word of God says, and I see not only does Israel return, not only is it attacked by Iran and others, but Jerusalem becomes the centerpiece. It is ground zero. Mm -hmm. And then Zechariah says, and Jesus says in Luke 21, when you see the nations beginning to surround Jerusalem, you will know. Well, wait a minute. Why? If there's not a returned Israel, why would the nations... Why would it matter? Because yeah. Israel has returned, they have claimed legal possession of Jerusalem as the capital. The nations are in a frenzy about it. Well, let's take a break and we'll continue talking about that, the importance of Jerusalem in end times prophecy. Why does it matter? Why is Jerusalem such a 
cup of staggering, as Zechariah wrote. Uh, we're talking with Pastor Carl Gallops, and Unraveling Revelation continues after this. It's time for Back to School, and we have a special offer in September at the Gilbert House store. Back to School, it's impossible to believe. Where did the year go? Well, October is also approaching, so we have a deal for you. $35 only, plus shipping and handling, will get you two amazing books and a CD, which is interviews with Dr. Michael Heiser. Preparing you for All Hallows Eve, the month of October, when we begin to think about the spirit realm, our book, Veneration, which takes a deep dive into the cult of the Nephilim around ancient Israel, the source of the demons that plague the world to this day. And also a wonderful book by our friend, Vicki Joy Anderson, They Only Come Out at Night. This is your manual for spiritual warfare. This should be in your church library. Those two books, plus a seven-hour audio CD with Dr. Michael S. Heiser discussing the unseen realm. These two books, plus the CD, just $35 plus shipping and handling only at gilberthouse.org store. Welcome back to Unraveling Revelation. I'm Derek Gilbert. Please visit our store uh, because not only, not only do we have the monthly deals on books and DVDs, but we've also got, uh, I guess what the kids these days call merch. Um, yeah. Coffee mugs. These are wonderful mugs. And uh, in addition to T-shirts, both for our, our little network here, but for Sharon's Red Wing Saga series of supernatural thrillers, you'll find the link right there at the front page of our store, gilberthouse.org slash store. Our good friend Kenny C., his fiance Gidget Manning, do all of the mugs and T-shirts for us. You've met Kenny, haven't you? I have. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful yeah. encourager. That is his superpower, his spiritual gift. <laughs> and uh, he is a music teacher. And actually what they do with the proceeds they earn from the mugs, the t-shirts, and so on. He uses the proceeds to buy musical instruments for his students whose families cannot afford them. Yeah. So the yeah. gift of music through these things, again, gilberthouse.org slash store. Um, Carl, you, you wrote the book, Gods of Ground Zero. I do. And uh, in the broad sense, Israel is ground zero, but in the narrow sense, uh, the Mount of Assembly, Mount of Congregation, the Har Moed, the uh, Ar Megedon yeah. is the Temple Mount. Uh, yeah. Why does it matter and how, why is Israel's return and control of that 35 acres so important? Oh, wow, I could do two hours on this. <laughs> I'm, try I'm trying to get it down into just a few minutes. <laughs> Bottom line, Gods of Ground Zero goes through this as well as some other books I've written and books you have written. But, but I'll give the synopsis to the audience. And you always step on dangerous ground when you give a synopsis of something that's so detailed. Because right, right. People say, he didn't even say this. He didn't yeah. even say that. He left this out. He left, no, I just only had five minutes. You right. got three bullet, hours. Bullet points. Yeah, yeah, bullet points. So here are my bullet points. I am convinced, and many other scholars, everything I'm going to say is in my book, and it's all referenced with peer-reviewed, renowned scholars. That doesn't mean they're all correct. It doesn't make me correct. It just I'm telling you, I'm not pulling this out of my back pocket, mm -hmm. okay? So it's scholarly based, biblically based. I am convinced that the Garden of Eden was right there in that area. Now, you agree? Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's so much scholarship to indicate that. Well, I am convinced that when Jesus knelt in the Garden of Gethsemane, he told the disciples, go there, I'm going to a certain place. Why would he go to a certain place? Why would they be a stone's throw? Stone's throw is pretty good distance. It's night. And he battles Satan. And his last words, the second Adam, Paul calls him, is reversing the curse of the first Adam. Nevertheless, not my will. See, the first curse was Satan, Adam, and Eve telling God, my will, not yours. We're following him. The second Adam comes. He goes to a certain spot. He kneels and he said, nevertheless, I'm the second Adam, I'm in the flesh, not my will, but the throne of heaven's will. And then he gets up and goes to the cross and pays for what he said and rises from the grave to prove who he is and always has been. And that the whole thing was a trap and a set up for Satan to step right in it. Hmm. He did. He filled Judas, he says, with his presence. Jesus said, he's entered into Judas to deliver me to the cross, which means if the cross was Satan's defeat, it means Satan didn't understand that fine point. Yeah. Otherwise, why would he arrange for his own defeat? As Paul wrote, 1 Corinthians 6, uh, yeah, verse 8, right. if the that's archons, right. the rulers of the age, had that's understood right. that they would they not have crucified would the Lord of glory. not have crucified, yeah. but they did, so they didn't understand it. Right. That's my point. I've been screaming this forever, is that, and, and, and a lot of people say, oh, that can't be. Well, it, the Bible says it. 
The Bible says it. So anyway, so there's a battle for that whole place. Look at the temple that was there. Then Babylon destroys it. The temple's rebuilt. Then the Romans destroy it, the new Babylon of their day. Mm -hmm. They destroy it again. Uh, the, the Jews are scattered. The Jews are persecuted all in that area. Uh, when God brings them out of Egypt, he said, I'm going to take you to a place where I've put my name. And boy, I mean, it's actually written in the valleys. It's read his name, the Sheen, the Tyropian, the Kidron, the, the, uh, the Hinnom Valley, make a perfect Sheen. It's right there in the mountains, in the valleys. He took them to the place mm -hmm. where he put his name. And then on that Temple Mount n located near, somewhere near where Abraham offered Isaac. Right. And it may be in that exact spot. He said, took him to the region of Moriah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so the, the, all of this comes right down to that. Well, what was all that about? Abraham and Isaac. It was a picture of Jesus, the Lamb that was substituted, the Ram, the male, the full-grown male Lamb that was substituted for him. I mean, his his horns caught in the thistles. It's like the crown of thorns. I mean, it, it's all there. A three-day journey, but after three days, Isaac is alive again. You know, I mean, the whole picture is there. Where did all that take place? Right there. It just occurred to me, and we, we kind of touched on this previously, uh, in dealing with the, the return of Israel to the land, all, all of this, I think we can understand why the fallen realm, Satan and his minions, would want control of that mountain, this Mount of Assembly yeah, of Eden. Uh, and and uh, we, we argued in our book from a different angle, but uh, we came to the same conclusion, that, that Ground Zero, Eden, was there at Jerusalem. That was the center of the world. It is. If this was a false return, if this was a fake Israel, why would the enemy waste so much energy That's my from point. Persia, from the Muslim neighborhoods, uh, the, the Muslim neighbors of, of Israel in trying to take it back? If, they all, it was all, if Israel is already a satanic nation under the control of the God of this world, why would then, it? Then Satan could say, yes, I've got it. But he doesn't have it because they're not fake. So, so you're right. And so the proof that Eden was there, the biblical proof, is in the book of Hebrews because it says everything that you see, the temple and all of it, is only a copy of what's behind the veil. But the real thing is behind the veil. Well, what's the real thing? The real temple, the real presence of God. The re Where was that on earth? Eden. The Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. That's what God did. God had another creation before he created this universe. The angels were there. They were from another creation. Mm -hmm. he, he says to Job, were, were, were you there? Were, were you there yeah. with the angels, the B'nai Elohim, the sons of God, shouted for joy? And no, no. And, and so, so the point is that when he, Satan wanted that, he, he stole it through the garden experience. And then he claimed it as his own, and he has ever since. But the veil fell, guarded by the cherubim. And the book of Hebrew tells us, but behind that veil, what is that veil? It's a portal. It's a, a dimension. God is God of dimensions, the realms, the unseen realms. He created mm -hmm. them all. So when that fell, where did it fall? In Jerusalem area, in the Temple Mount area. So why was the Temple Mount there? That's, that's ground zero. Right outside is probably where Jesus knelt, is where the sin probably took place in the garden. That He went over there to redeem all of humanity. And, and he kneels in a certain spot mm -hmm. and turns it back over to God. And Paul says two or three times, he's the second Adam. Through, one, through first Adam came sin, through the second Adam came our redemption. And so I, there's so many signs, so mm -hmm. many signs. Again, the book, the book Gods of Ground Zero goes into much more detail. The filth that went on there in the garden and the, in, the, in the temptation, that's all talked about through the Bible, the scholarship. I've got all that there, kind of what really happened in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. That's tied to the days of Noah, the sons of God, coming unto the daughters of men. Then God finally pushes the reset button on the whole thing. But behind the veil is the real Eden. When Paul said, yeah. I was caught up to paradise, to the third heaven, the word up just means into another realm because we're on a ball floating in space. And so which way is up? Well, out. It's out. It's another place. But it's just a way we humanly describe. It's like when John saw, sees the door open and he, he says, come up here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you're not going, you know, I mean, you're going through something into another realm. And so, so Satan, what did he do after that second temple was destroyed? 
he plants on it the mosque. Yeah. The Dome of the Rock. Mm -hmm. Right there. And you know the, where it's built is on the slab stone, which the Jews think is the center of the earth, the yeah, foundational right. stone of foundation the earth. Foundation stone, right. It's where the temple was built. Mm -hmm. Satan wipes out the temple and puts his temple. And I'm going to say this, again, not disparaging everything, anybody just going through history. The Bible talks about an abomination of desolation will be set up in a holy place. It, do, it doesn't mean in the holy of holies in the temple, those words don't match in a holy place, one of the most, holy, the most holy place on the planet is Jerusalem, okay? And so what's on the Temple Mount? An abomination. Yeah. And the religion behind it causes desolation wherever it goes. Absolutely. And I'm not saying that there might not be a greater fulfillment of the abomination that causes the desolation, but I'm saying there's already one there. It's been there for a thousand years or more. We see a lot of already but not yet yes. prophecies yes. in yes. terms of fulfillment yes. all throughout Scripture. Yes. So, so that's you, you. You made excellent points. Why would the nations be enraged? Why would Satan be enraged if it, these were fake Jews and a fake Israel? So that, that belongs to him now. He can do what he wants to with it. But, but see, he is fighting. He knows his time is short. He's filled with rage. He does not want to let go of what he thinks is rightfully his. He stole it. Just like a regular criminal thug. He steals it. He gets it. Somebody steals it from there. Hey, you stole that from me. Well, it was never rightfully yours. Now, when the owner comes and gets it, not only did he not steal it, he's reclaiming what was rightfully his from the beginning. So this is, this is the thinking of this prideful one, this, yeah. this, this psychopath, egotist, this, this, you know, used to be a cherubim at the throne of God. This is his mindset. The parable of the wicked tenants. When yeah. the owner of the vineyard comes back yeah. to reclaim yes, what sir. is rightfully his, because they killed his son thinking they would take his inheritance. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's the picture. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they yeah. will be destroyed. Yeah. And the Bible tells us is there are prophecies, Isaiah 20. 426 of the the destruction of these uh, fallen entities in the last days the yes. host of heaven in heaven and the kings yes. of the earth on the earth be punished and uh, boy we're looking it, forward it, it to that talks day about there will be the powers of the heavens will be shaken and when you look at that the word powers in the greek are on, it, that word is only used to speak of the power of the angelic realm or the power of the demonic realm mm. that particular word is only used there and when and when Jesus says the powers of the heavens, that means the realms, the powers, the angelic, the demonic. And, and then he says people will faint in those days when they see what's coming upon oh, them. And that word faint is, is, is in, that's in the King James, but the Greek word means they will, they will die. They will die of, a heart, they will die of heart attacks. Mm -hmm. when they, their hearts will fail them is what it should say by, by the Greek when they see what's coming. Well, what's coming? Jesus said the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Yeah. Angels yeah. and demons. I mean, you know, it's going to be just like the days of Noah, Jesus said. Amen. Sons oh, of come God. quickly, Lord. Yeah. Pastor Carl Gallops, thank you for joining us. Thank you. We Those are my quick talking quite, points. Quite. <laughs> I'm not the heretic you might think I am. I'm really not. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you can follow him online, his work at uh, carlgallops.com. And we thank you for watching. This is Unraveling Revelation. Unraveling Revelation is a viewer supported outreach of Gilbert House Ministries. Follow us online at unravelingrevelation.tv and gilberthouse.org. That's where you'll find our weekly Bible study, the Gilbert House Fellowship. We'd love to hear from you. Contact us through our websites or drop us a line at P.O. Box 78, Crane, Missouri 65633.